I just want to say really quickly, some of the tweets we have coming through today are really inspiring. Um, someone tweeted, I stand for feminism. I do too. Someone else tweeted, I stand for diversity, which I think we can all agree is a great thing. And one of the most powerful ones is um, a woman was joined by a male friend and they tweeted, I stand for ending sexual assault, which is a really important and powerful one. So speaking of inspirational, we're going to get to our next panel. And it is, I stand for women in war and peace, which is something all of us should stand for. Um, here to talk about what we can all do to help women affected by war is Kim Barker, who is on this end, wearing the fabulous necklace. She was the South Asian Bureau Chief for the Chicago Tribune, and her book, The Taliban Shuffle, Strange Days in Afghanistan and Pakistan, inspired the film Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, starring Tina Fey, which some of you might have seen. Let's give her a round of applause. Ginny Redeker, who is right behind me, and I will move so you all can see her in a second, is a documentary filmmaker of the acclaimed Women, War, and Peace, which focuses on the lives of women in war zones. Ginny. And author Joy Deep Roy Bhattacharya, did I get it right? I practiced that one several times upstairs. His touching novel is The Watch, which well, you can say it features a contemporary Antigone, who we all talked about earlier as someone who stood up for what was right, politically, even though there was a cost. And they will all be interviewed by someone who I believe could teach a master class in resilience. Lee Woodruff is not oh, only an acclaimed writer and the author of the best-selling book. <laughs> oh, he didn't... Yeah, that was clever. My apologies. <laughs> He did not get his applause. Oh, you know what? Good for you. We have to make this equal. Thank you. Thank you for that, because he certainly... Okay. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Um, and I also was still standing in his way, so joy you. Okay. And so as I was saying, Lee Woodruff, who could teach a master class in resilience, she is not only the author of the best-selling book, In an Instant, which documents her family's road to recovery after the roadside bombing of her husband, the fabulous journalist uh, Bob Woodruff, but she's also the founder with him of the Bob Woodruff Foundation, which helps wounded service members and their families. So talk about someone who's devoting their life to bringing about important, meaningful change. Please help me welcome again, Kim, Jenny, Joy, and Lee. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Can you, I'll just do a little sound check here. Is everybody okay? Okay. Someone's doing a hand wave over there on the right. Are you, you're good? Is the mic, okay. Great. So our panel is gonna be talking about women, war, and conflict. And each one of these panelists stands for some really important things in this area. Um, we're gonna direct some specific questions to them, but I just wanted to, to in, from my own perspective, talk about how it's impossible to think about peace without including women and their voices and everything that they do, they mobilize, they organize, they care, they tend, they befriend. And so with more than 50% of the population, we need more than 50% of all of that, all of those attributes that women bring in conversations and gender-based conversations about war. I shared this story with my panelists when I talked to each of them, um, and I'm gonna share it with you because I love this quick, quick story. And I was rereading The Lord of the Flies on an Audible book. And in the recording of the, the new recording of the book, the author had done an update. And he, in the introduction, said, that over the years he's been asked, why didn't you have any women on the island? Why was it all little boys? Are you a misogynist? Was there something you had against women? Are you a sexist? And he said, my answer is really simple. He said, if there were women on that island, there wouldn't have been a story because they would have set up a hospital, a garden, they would have had a school, they would have organized the entire thing and there would have been no conflict whatsoever. And I love that story because it leads into exactly what we're gonna talk about here, which is how do we bring all of the things that women, that, that stand for women and, uh, and, and what that means into the horrible 
um, side of war. So I'm going to ask each panelist in just a few sentences to explain what each of you think is the role of women in the theater of war and conflict and what the ancient story of Antigone can teach us in this modern day. So Kim, can we start with you? Well, I mean, it's so difficult because women typically are not on the front lines and we tell the history really of the world, not through the history of anything but war. It's always like this battle was fought, this battle was fought, going all the way back to Herodotus. It's not like you have women as part of that. And I think it would be a great idea to rewrite history looking at the perspective of women during these wars because they are the ones who are, you know, basically keeping things alive on the home front. They're often the largest victims of war, you know, treated like uh, the spoils of war. And you don't necessarily have that as a part of the conversation. Uh, as far as how Antigone relates into that, I think that Joy Deep is better to talk about that, so I will. You know what, Joy Deep, before you go on too, for those of you who have just joined, and just not to belabor this, but in case you don't know the story of Antigone, I just, it's the 2,500 year old story by Sophocles. And Antigone was a teenager who stood up to her uncle, the king, and defied his decree to honor her dead brother. So despite the consequences, she went back to get her brother's body. So that has set the stage for the role of women in peace, and it's still a very relevant story. So would you like to answer? I'm just explaining the Antigone story in the framework of okay. what this means. In case anyone has Hello. a question. Hello, yep. A um, couple of years ago, I wrote a novel called Antigone in Kandahar which was published here under the title of The Watch because my English language publishers thought two foreign words in a title would probably be too much for the reading audience. Uh, I first... Hello, is this better? Yeah. Um, I met Antigone when I was 16. Uh, it was a prescribed textbook in school in India. And uh, I was 17 and I fell in love with her. And uh, 30 years later, I decided that the best way to really hone in on what she represented was to become her in a theater of conflict where women and children constitute the overwhelming uh, proportion of casualties. Um, I decided to place her in Afghanistan because of many overlaps between classical Greek culture and contemporary Afghan tribal culture. This was, of course, before contemporary Afghan tribal culture was corrupted by the Saudi Wahhabis. Um, as an aside, and this is a preliminary to what I'm just about to say, my friends always say I overstate the case, I became an American citizen this year after 28 years of living in this country. And uh, All right. people outside of America, and a lot of my American friends asked me if I was insane. Uh, and this as a premise to what I'm going to say, I decided to pick the story of Antigone because I wanted to study the Jekyll and Hyde character of American foreign policy. And I say American foreign policy, not the United States and not Americans. The perception, the self-perception of American foreign policy that it is a force of absolute good, which is constantly pounded into us by the manuf manufactured media, versus the reality on the ground in much of the non-white world where it is a force of absolute evil. I decided to use Antigone because I needed a figure who wasn't corrupt. My Antigone is also the casualty of a drone attack uh, when she faces the contemporary progenitors of Creon, an American army base, they don't know what to do with her. And uh, as one of the soldiers says, she has no business being in a war zone, totally missing the irony that the war zone is her country. That's why I decided to use the, the story of Antigone because her moral rectitude, you could call it a teenager's cussedness, her refusal to compromise, 
spoke volumes to me in an age where we are basically living in the kingdom of Creon. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask if the cowboy boots came with the citizenship, because that's a really cool touch, I have to say. And you're wearing them well. Um, Ginny, do you want me to go back to the original question? Just I mean, I, I, I think I really agree with Kim saying that my experience has been that war has really been told from battles and soldiers and that women are really left out of the story. And when I made uh, a film about what women did in Liberia did to bring an end to the conflict there, I was really acutely aware of how all the images coming out of the Civil War in Liberia were like of child soldiers with guns that were probably bigger than they were because it kind of reinforced a certain stereotype that we had and that there was a story of Christian and Muslim women joining together and forcing it, the, the men to, into a peace talk. And when the peace talks didn't, uh, weren't reaching fruition because they were just using it as, as a place to have further their positions, the women surrounded the peace hall and they refused to let the men out until they reached an agreement. And this was a story that was completely disappearing from history. So I kind of feel like it's so important that the stories are told not only for what Joydeep was saying, because I think that our idea of who we are in the world and what war is at our war, but also that there's stories of hope and there's stories of other ways of resolving conflict and there's stories that we could look to that would actually give us ideas about how to do things that would be different. I'm the bearded lady here. I wish the male-female dichotomy was as clearly black and white because I'm constantly reminded of Madeleine Albright's querulous query to Colin Powell when he was hesitating to introduce uh, armed forces in, into the Middle East in the, mid, in the mid 90s, which was quote unquote, what is the point of having an army if you can't use it? I'm also gonna drop some names for you which kind of clouds the picture, which shows you that our warlords today are unfortunately as, as much women as men. Am I allowed to mention names? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Um, Samantha Power and Mary Slaughter, you know, you can make a name like that in fiction. Um, both the Rices, Michelle Flournoy, who's probably going to become the Secretary of State. We've, we've, we've come to a point where we've normalized war. It's war 24-7. We were talking about this upstairs about how understandably, with all of the channels of information that are directed at us, the average person feels war fatigue. As testified by this audience, you would think a topic as pressing as this would have people basically blocking the avenue. But there we go. But there we go. So let's talk about that for a minute, because we were speaking about war fatigue, and just we are 13 plus years of war, None of you want to hear it in the media, and yet Kim chose to go to Afghanistan to find the stories, the interesting stories that weren't necessarily the big, giant war stories. And we'd be remiss not to ask you, how did it feel to have Tina Fey play you in the movie? That's pretty cool. I can't answer cool. all that, and that's, <laughs> that's a different question. You can ask me afterwards. Um, I, I covered Afghanistan and Pakistan and India for five years between 2004 and 2009. And when you're a journalist living in a situation like that, you feel like what is happening around you is the most important story in the world. Um, you know, being able to have people trust you with their stories. And, you know, in Afghanistan, I'm always asked, what was it like being a woman there? Well, it was awesome because I had access to half the population that men didn't really have access to. And I also had fine access to the men and the warlords there. So I tried to tell those stories about women, and I remember at <laughs> certain points my bosses would be like, not another story about the women, and I felt like it was part of my obligation to tell those stories, because I also feel like we used, as America, um, women there as a pretext to be able to rally. This is really awful, isn't it, this microphone? You can hear me? Okay, I'm hearing myself five times over. Um, anyway, so, you know, in the very beginning of, of after 9-11 in November of 2001, Laura Bush basically took over her husband, uh, President Bush's radio program, 
and talked about the treatment of the women in Afghanistan by the Taliban and how they had been brutalized in soccer stadiums and their hands were cut off and really rallied other countries and liberals in this country to support what was happening in Afghanistan, using the women there, and then telling the women there to take off their burqas, telling the women there that like a quarter of parliamentary seats would be re reserved for women, come out, be teachers, be police officers, when there wasn't even really security. And now we're talking about negotiating with the Taliban, um, you know, to try to come up with a peace deal, which is probably the only way forward. But I guess I'd ask the audience, does anybody here know that there still is a war going on in Afghanistan? Some people do. Does, did, has anybody heard Afghanistan come up at all in the presidential debates? I mean, has Syria really come up, except for the fear that we have of ISIS and like that they might come here and a kid might bomb us and it's always about us, right? I mean, that's all you hear really about foreign policy. And it, when it comes to Syria, when it comes to what's happening in Afghanistan, going to your point, Lee, about the whole idea of inundation, right? We're in a, actually, I think, a more peaceful time now than we've been in the history of the world. You know, we're a violent people, we're a violent species. We tend to kill each other a lot and we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, but the pictures you see now, the fact that you're inundated on social media with images of a little boy sitting in an ambulance seat looking out with a vacant stare and blood on his head, that was supposed to be a game changer. Much like the year before, the picture of the little boy walking, washing up on the shores of Turkey, that was supposed to be a game changer. There was the Coney video about what was happening, you know, I, was that Liberia? Yeah. That was supposed to be a game changer. None of this was game changers. It's just like, I feel like nowadays people feel like con compassion consists of liking something on Twitter or retweeting it or liking it on Facebook or posting this outrage, but that there's no real sense that, you know, we owe the world anything. And to that point, I think that we do have to have a foreign policy that acknowledges that. Like it or not, the UN kind of is broken. I mean, it's great, the success of the UN is that the UN actually exists. It's amazing that there's a place in the world where all countries come together. That is the success of the UN. But when it comes to having, you know, enforcing peace or you no know, fly zones or anything like that, that's not really what the UN is great at. And we're in the position of the states of like, like it or not, we're seen as the world's police, the police force. And I think as a country, we haven't really debated that. Like, should we be? Should we step back? And I hear this sense, especially in the last year, of isolationism. Everybody wanting to pull back in. And I don't know that that is the right decision either. But it's a conversation we don't even have, because we're so fearful right now of what might happen. Ginny, what is the role of documentaries like yours? And are they able to, if we, if we can't grab, if a picture of a, a dead boy on a shore can't grab us, we retweet it and we turn to Kim Kardashian and her jewelry heist <laughs> and we're done. I mean, I guess it, it's, go, to me, a lot of it is what kind of stories do you tell? And I, don't, I, I think like the picture of the little boy being washed ashore, those, there's something that makes you hopeless inside because you think, what can I do? And this, so, so I'd rather go to Kim Kardashian. So I think, you know, I mean, it's kind of, what can you do? And people do feel like hopeless and like it's so far away. So I kind of feel telling stories about how people come together to figure out that exact question. How do you resolve conflict? You know, where are there people that are doing things that, well, I could imitate that, or if they, if they can do those things in their life, that that can give me hope to try to figure out how to do things here. And I think that the, re, the constant reinforcement of, Sort of hopelessness really does make all of us hopeless. I think the one thing we all have in common is the conviction that we have to expose the realities of war to an audience that would rather not make contact. And the reason that audience would rather not make contact is that audience, unlike previous wars, is not paying a price. There are minuscule American casualties. It doesn't mean the wars aren't going on. It doesn't mean the costs aren't horrific. And, you know, much as I would like to believe we can actually have a conversation on pulling back, with 900 military bases across the world, we have a deep state. We have a military-industrial complex that is so 
deeply invested in keeping wars going, I'm just going to drop some figures for you. $657 billion annually, $657 billion on the military budget. 66 cents of every tax dollar we pay going for military expenses. Six trillion dollars misplaced by the Pentagon this year. One of the things I discovered researching my book is that the American military is actually a large, very dysfunctional corporation. It is corrupt, it is top-heavy, in fact, it is more top-heavy than any army in the history of man. Less than 6% of US soldiers sailors, pilots actually see combat. All of those ribboned generals that you see on TV have probably never fired a gun in combat. The ones who are sent to combat zones because they have quote unquote volunteered are sent back again and again and again until they're exhausted and they come back and they're completely dysfunctional to themselves, their families, they are the walking dead. We don't have these conversations because we are not supposed to have these conversations. We are faced with the wall of Kardashians. But if you took a step back, we could fill up this entire building with the casualties of American wars this year. This building nearly isn't big enough, thank you. Yeah, because you must include the circle of their families in that when you of do. Of course, yeah. of course. And when you read Joy Deep's book, The Watch, you will see that he is as sympathetic not only to the people of Afghanistan as he is to the soldiers, which I think was a very interesting perspective in your book. You became very close to many of those soldiers in the yep. process of writing this so that you are not necessarily anti-service, you are anti-war. Yeah, because the other thing we don't know is these are kids. We send kids to war. The average out? private yeah. should be in school, should be in college. The average commanding officer up to the rank of a captain, by the time you're 27, you're known as an old man. You must have seen it in the basis, right? I mean, it's an insane situation. They're thrown into these combat zones with no cultural experience. They're supposed to be village headman, diplomat, general, you know, plumber, carpenter, fixer-upper, and they are overwhelmed. So and the bureaucracy is staggering. They carry the weight of tasks they have not been trained to do. And I want to ask Kim. I would, I would just add one thing to that. Um, I mean, I know it's probably really controversial to say this, but I think that if you're going to, as a government, open up, up different fronts and different wars, that, and you have a military that's volunteer, where the people who sign up generally are poor, they come from lower income neighborhoods, they see this as their way out of poverty, or they're true patriots, whatever that means, and they have a record of service in their families. When those are the only people who are signing up for the military and you decide to have two different war fronts at the same time and nobody who is making decisions about that has any skin in the game. It's very rare that there is, I know there have been some lawmakers who have children who are in the military and at this point have even served, served but it, most people don't know anybody who is in the military. Most people do not have relatives in the military. And if you're going to open up these fronts, I think that you have to raise the question of whether we should have a draft so that there's more sort of like, everybody has responsibility and then everybody would be paying attention to what's going on. But right now we let our wars be fought by people who don't look like us, you know, and who aren't us in New York. Um, and I think that's a real issue. It's also the largest standing um, army of orphans. Interesting fact to know. So when you have no family, you find your tribe, but you're, you're with a, a group of of folks who are as dispossessed as you in the sense, in that sense. So it's a really good point. I personally believe in the draft. I think that when you have skin in the game, and Jenny, that was going to be my question to you, when there is skin in the game, how does that affect 
the conversation on all sides of the table. So pick a country like Liberia, when those women have skin in the game, when the, the men who fight have skin in the game. What do you see? Oh, I mean, I think, you know, I was thinking more of when I was growing up and there was the draft here during the Vietnam War, and believe me, that had a much different face to it, and there was a really huge anti-war movement, and I really fought against the draft, which now I kind of believe there should be a draft, and I would still fight against it because I was against the war. <laughs> But you, but you, but everybody, everybody has skin in the game, and I think that it, that it's really, really an important issue. Because yeah, we can just keep doing this, and and you know, the, I'm gonna have to say that the women in Liberia, part of what happened there is, they really, really had skin in the game because the war was getting so bad that they were being pushed out to sea, and they were, they were all gonna die, and so that 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 will get your attention really fast. Um, so. I do think that we're able to kind of continue the situation where, like, I had no idea that there were, I, that there was 900 military bases when you just said that. I, I was like, wow, I didn't know that. Um, to just take the ball to the other court, right? Almost everyone I have talked to in the Middle East, in South Asia, in Africa, in all of the zones where the United States is in combat has basically had one question. Can the Americans just go home? Maybe it'll take us a generation of bloodletting after that, maybe two generations. But my God, we've been around for thousands of years and we've survived. I would disagree though, in Afghanistan that is not the case. In Afghanistan, it, it is a very different situation than Iraq. I talked to Afghans for the years I was there and I'm still talking to Afghans. And they're upset with Americans largely because of two wedge issues that have come up. One is civilian casualties that everybody's heard a lot about, and the other is corruption. And average Afghans, when they see these civilian casualties and corruption, they start seeing, especially in the South, they can see the Taliban as a more, at least you know the justice you're getting with the Taliban and you don't have to pay for it. But as frustrated as average Afghans are, their biggest fear is that the West is going to pull out again just like it did after the Soviets left in 1989 and then the country will descend again into chaos and into civil war. Not that the Taliban will come marching back in but that all the old factions will start fighting against each other. And so the Afghans I still talk to, that is their biggest fear and you know the educated ones are doing all they can to get out because they believe it, that the West and America pr primarily is not going to stick around for the long haul and for what it takes to actually shore up a country after this many decades of war. Well, Goody, we're going to disagree. <laughs> I, I actually, I'm just saying also, when I was in Benghazi, there was, the, you know, the, people there had definitely wanted, people in Libya had definitely wanted the United States and the, the, they had wanted to be protected against Gaddafi. And that was, I met so many people who said that, so I think that it's not everybody. You know, living in the United States, it's a temptation to see foreign countries as unified entities. Even the United States is not a unified culture. When I was a graduate student, my Jewish girlfriend and I wanted to drive to Louisiana and they said, what are you, high with New York license plates, an Indian and a Jew? Um, Afghanistan, it depends on what Afghan you talk to. Are you talking about the t Turkmen? Are you talking about the Uzbeks? Are you talking about the, 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 the Pashtos? Are you talking about the Taz Tajiks? My experience is with Kandahar and the Pashtuns, and I can tell you they cannot wait for the Americans to leave because, as you pointed out, the Taliban presented a bedrock of incorruptibility that at this point, after 15 years of blundering, They've had it with NGOs. They've had it with American in, uh, bases. They've had, what is this? $14 million base, Plum Center in Helmand, equipped with state-of-the-art you know, conference uh, 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 technology that is just sitting there. Seven years later, the chairs are still covered with plastic. It's just sitting there. Um, you know, I think there is a fundamental missionary impulse in the American psyche that makes us, and I say us, without a catch in my voice, believe that we can actually help people over there. I've heard this again and again and again, and I think this is a mistake. I think we've got to start by helping ourselves here. We've got to build our infrastructure, we've got to repair a, med me you know, a medical system that doesn't exist. There are so many things to do at home, and we're pouring money down 
the defense drain. I agree with you, we do not have a foreign policy. All right, so I want to just sort of redirect us back to the, the area of women and conflict. So what I'm hearing with both of you are two sides of the same coin in that where is our solution? So how do we empower the women in these countries to be able to come to the table and, and make the change? Because it's clearly not going to come from the top down with might makes right or throwing thousands of USAID dollars in places where they're just going to end up in the warlord's hands. So how, how can we play a role in this country or in the world or in the UN in empowering these women? I, th I think that like in Afghanistan, again, we went in there in the very beginning using women. And so, I mean, there were NGOs doing things in 2002, like handing out condoms and advocating safe sex in Afghanistan, which is nuts because there was no security there. And the idea of safe sex and a woman being able to choose that, she couldn't, right? And in, in, air, in a country like Afghanistan, you can't go in there. The biggest mistake you, you can make is going into a country like that and telling women, you can do anything you want. You can be anybody you want. I remember this woman um, named Debbie Rodriguez. She wrote the book, well, she had a ghostwriter who did the book, uh, The Kabul Beauty School. And she wrote about trying to empower those women and tell those hairdressers they should leave their abusive spouses. And she wrote about them. And she wrote about the little, like, community she created there. And uh, she then had pictures in the book. She, didn't, she gave them pseudonyms, but there were pictures of the women in the book, and essentially they all had to flee because she, after she already had left, because she was another one of these women that goes in there and tells women they can do anything, be anyone, and the women starts to believe them, and then the American is gone. And that's a real dangerous choice to make. In a country like Afghanistan, there are amazing women leaders and they come from the elite. It's a question of how do you get to a rural area? How do you talk about women there? And what you have to do is first you've got to go through the imam and you've got to teach the imam or the tribal elder about why it's important to have women empowered or at least educated so that they can educate you know, their sons and their daughters and so they can you know, actually add value to the community and you have to go through the man and that is a horrible thing to say to an audience of Americans, right? Nobody wants to hear that. But the other way, you're just setting women up for failure and you're setting them up to be killed. There is a French couple, they're still alive, Roland and Sabrina Michaud, please Google them. They went to Afghanistan every year between 1962 and 1979 and took photographs that will show you the country the way it was before the Russians and the Americans destroyed it. The temptation when we talk about Afghanistan or Libya or Syria or Iraq is to start from the point in time of the American invasion when the country had already been destroyed. Afghanistan has very rich tribal cultural traditions. Google a word called Lande, L-A-N-D-A-Y. Lande are poems written by Afghan women in the villages, this is folk poetry, which taps into a very deep strain of shame culture. We'd like to believe that it's the men who dominate the society, but it's much more complicated. Afghan women within the villages take lovers, write poetry like Landes, which is very sexual, and I can tell you would not be permitted on primetime TV. They control the men in many ways that would resemble the situation in Lysistrata. I think once again, it takes a long time to actually go native, something that the British, for instance, did in India for over 200 years. In 1905, at the peak of the British Raj, there were 19,000 British administrators for a population of nearly 300 million. That is a ratio that is so skewed as to beggar belief. The British were able to do this because they took time, hundreds of years to learn the culture. We go in, we think we can fix things overnight. If we cannot fix things overnight, we lose patience, we pull out whatever we started, is left in absolute smithereens. But we're talking about 2005, not 1905. And right now you have women traded their 
you know, like chattel, and you have women who were killed in honor killings if they would be sleeping around in the village. We're talking about a different time. And that's the last I'll say about it, because I think that, like... I mean, I just, I feel like it's also that there's conflict all over the world that's, that, yes, we're responsible as Americans for what we're involved in, but in general, I think that we need to, since I'm a storyteller, I really feel the importance of telling stories and I, that are about how, say, different ways of resolving conflict. And so, like, sometimes women are called manipulative because we kind of can figure out since a lot of times we don't have brute force or we can't, we don't control the military, so how do we figure out different ways of getting around things, of, of resolving conflict? I think those stories need to be told more and more. I also think if we demanded um, that in peace processes that there was 50% of women at peace tables to resolve conflict, I think that would make a huge difference. Um, and I think that also to recognize, I say like in the Irish and the Good Friday Agreements, women played a really critical role. And the things that they put into the plan were things like human rights, jobs, economic security for everybody. It's interesting that those things didn't get benchmarks attached to them, that what got attached was that who's got what position. So I think that there's a lot of ways that we could support what women are doing and by telling their stories, by looking at what kind of ways they bring to change conflict and to resolve conflict and also by insisting that their presence is on peace talks and in peace negotiations. Yeah, I think we're having a fundam fundamental cultural difference here. You know, I think you're looking at the story from a very Western perspective. I think you're looking at it from men's perspective. No, 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 no. <laughs> hang on. It's not that black <laughs> and white. Uh, let, let me give you an anecdote, right? The Pakistani anthrop anthropologist Ayesha Siddiqui did a very extent extensive study of oral storytelling in Afghan culture and Pashtun culture in the 1970s. The Pashtuns communicate history through storytelling. This was part of the Sufi religion, also part of their tribal culture. She visited almost 50% of villages in Afghanistan through the 1970s and took down the anecdotes. She went back in 2003. She could only find three storytellers, and these were predominantly male storytellers. So the casualties are not just women, they're men, they are the culture themselves. I agree we're not in 1905, I agree we're in 2005, but please, what is this missionary impulse to go, and you're not helping, you haven't helped. How much more experience do you need? You have 25 years of slaughter, no one's gonna be left. Are you gonna destroy the village to save it? So this is going to be one of these issues that we will never fix because there will always be a military industrial complex. There will always be a military. So what are the small ways? One of the things I loved about um, Gail Lemon's book, Ashley's War, which you, if you guys haven't read that, um, it's, it's, a, it's the story of a female elite military force because they realized early on what Kim was saying, you can't go knock on the door of, of a village as a male soldier and do anything without denigrating the custom or talk to the women or have a conversation with them. So they created this elite force of almost like, sort of like female seals. And the women were taught rudimentary um, language skills. And what they were able to do was go into the homes and befriend the women, tell them that they were coming not to knock their ho homes down or kill their children, but they wanted to have conversations and they would find who in the village are the, the people disrupting life or you know, committing the violences? And, and th these were ways of gathering intelligence. Now, is that stopping war? Is that pulling our big mighty fist out? It's not, but we aren't gonna change war. My two-year-old son, whom I raised with like Birkenstocks and like non-violence and everything, and no TV with any kind of violence, picked up a piece of toast at age two and chewed it into the shape of a gun and started going pew, pew. And I thought, okay, you know what? This is hardwired somewhere into testosterone. And we aren't going to change violence, but how can we change the way that we bring everyone to the table to make change in countries like this? Well, for this? one thing, I don't think the military industrial complex is going to be a permanent uh, institution. I don't think we can afford it. But let me just flip the equation and then I'm going to shut up, okay? Consider, I mean, I can't go to an American home and knock on the door. I mean, can you conceive of a situation where you go and up and down your own apartment building and knock on doors? I mean, that's just incongruous. Conceive of a situation where there is an Afghan military 
con contingent coming to your home and saying, and they're armed, right? We don't want to hurt you. We just want to know who, is, who are the people in the apartment building who are the troublemakers. I mean, do you see the problem here? There is no way you're going to be received as not being outsiders. I can't tell you how many Afghans have told me the Americans, the French, the British, they're just another tribe. Some Pashtun think this is a perpetuation of the Afghan wars from the early 20th century. We're talking about a totally different conception of being here, of culture. All right, so I've dragged us down the, the war rabbit hole, but where we have well, less than five minutes okay, left. Okay, I mean, so. I, I feel like I'm not sure that I'm saying what you think I'm saying, because I, I think that you're very much talking about, which is a good, really good thing to talk about, about U.S. foreign policy and our position in the world in the military industrial complex. I'm actually talking about stories from people that I feel I have a lot to learn from that have nothing to do with the U.S. Like the, a lot of the conflicts that I've seen or been up close has been actually the U.S. wasn't involved and it was really like so the women of Liberia. The U.S. was not involved in that conflict. So I'm talking about learning things from people in positions who are from those cultures and what I'm saying, I think that they have a let, lot to let, offer. Let, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. uh, it, would it be possible for you to take your crew, to take yourself, and go, for instance, to the Pentagon and do that kind of filming, do that kind of anthropological experiment, go to Fort, you know, that fort in Georgia that trains uh, foreign soldiers, go to any American military base and say, look, I'm not here to cause trouble. I want to find out what you guys are doing, what we're doing here, how we can resolve the issue without your actually picking up weapons. Is it possible? You're not going to be allowed near the base. We are totally running out of time, and I want to stay, I want to stay focused on women in the conflict. Because I think what we're talking about is how do we bring that yin and yang to this? How do you bring the women to the villages and create an equalized voice at the table? So any final thoughts from? I mean, I think it goes back to the idea that you have to come at women from the cultural perspective that you're at, and you need to like, work inside that framework. And in a city like Kabul, that's really possible. You know, in a city like Masri Sharif, it's very possible. In Kandahar, I did meet one woman who came out, and she, again, I'm a storyteller, right? You know, so, you know, I feel like we sold the women down there a bit of a bill of goods in that they're, they were told to come out and be teachers and police officers and what have you. And I always think about this woman, Malala Kakar, who came out in the very beginning. And she was a, you know, she was, she swore all the time, she smoked, although she didn't let me use it in my story. Uh, and when she first started as a cop in Kandahar, she carried her AK-47 beneath her burqa um, until she got to work, and then she put on a headscarf. And she was like watching her work with like, you know, women who were victims of forced marriages because that was her job, domestic violence areas and like forced marriages, you know, between like a 13-year-old and an 80-year-old guy. And she would police those and try to get families to accept love marriages and things like that. And the Taliban had threatened her a lot. And they had left what are called night letters that said things like, you know, you're very brave, Malalai, but if we catch you, we will kill you. And I said, are you scared to her? And she said, no, I'm not scared because I believe that we can build a better country. I believe we can build a democracy. And I believe what the Americans are saying about trying to build a place where women have rights. And, uh, you know, it goes without saying that that was, um, I think, June of 2006, and about a year and nine months later, she was killed and gunned down in front of her home. And that's what's happening to a lot of those women who have listened to us. And I think we owe something to this country. I do. And maybe you can call me a missionary or whatever. We helped mess it up back in the 80s. And yes, it had 10 years of brilliance of like women wearing mini skirts, if you think that's brilliant, in the 70s. But we're now in a situation where we're not where that is. And the people I talk to, granted they're not men in Kandahar, feel like we owe something to them and they'd rather we don't leave. Ginny? Well, pretty dynamic discussion. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of conflict, which is actually great. <laughs> which is actually, I think that it's, that's part of, a, yes, really part yeah. of a, something that needs to happen. And, and I actually don't think that we're really, I, I think that we're not as far apart as or deep you think that we are. I mean, I feel like that a lot of, I totally support a lot of things that you're saying, and I'm actually trying to bring something else to the conversation. And it's not, a, and I agree that it's not about being a missionary 
and I'd like to look at what, say, if it's not the military here, I'd like to see what the New York, I'd like to see what the police departments in, in all over this country are doing in terms of like the conflicts that we're having in our streets right now and how, what, what would that look like if there were, instead of a row of, of male guys with guns, if there was a, more women on the police force. I mean, just to bring it down right here into what we could do in this city. It, it, it just baffles me. We're a society where, this is a, an amazing statistic, every 37 seconds someone is arrested for drug possession. And we go to Syria, we go to, you know, bumfuck wherever, and tell people how to live their lives. I mean, this is just nuts. So I'm going to end on a story from my uh, husband, who's a um, foreign correspondent. And uh, when we were based in London years ago, um, when he was covering the wars in Bosnia, I remember him coming back just with his, what I call his mental flak jacket that he needed to remove. And, I would throw the children at him and make him go to like brownies and Girl Scouts and stuff and just re-enter what it meant to come back to the family life. And I remember he had covered finding a mass grave where there was just a small sneaker and a foot of a child that he had picked up. And he said, we'll never stop war. We'll never solve any of the conflict in this, con in this nation world um, until there are people who don't have nothing to lose. And so to, the, to your point of trying to bring, help women start businesses, give schools to girls, all of the things that we need to do, police forces that are benevolent and not just about throwing drug dealers in jail. We have so much work to do and that sounded really Pollyanna, but at the basic bottom of this, if we don't bring women to the table, if we don't listen to the voices of the women who are bearing and raising the children of the next generation, then we're gonna lose every time. So I want to thank all of you for being part of this. It was a great discussion. It was, it was wonderfully free-ranging and disparate, and that's what makes a great panel. And you need to read these two books. You need to, read, you need to watch the uh, Ginny's documentary. Um, you can find all that information online, and you need to stand for something. I don't know anybody that stands for war, as Kim said, so let's all stand for peace. And thank you so much for, for coming in and listening with us today. Thank you. Thank you.